Christine Greer, and I'm Mocha Sport Chair, and a 21-year ovarian cancer survivor. <laughs> We're so glad to see all of you here this evening. Mocha's annual meeting is a time when we connect with our community, reflect on our accomplishments of the past year, and look forward to making more progress in the future. Together, we are reaching new milestones and gaining positive momentum to change the course of ovarian cancer. Because of your support, MOCA continues to make a difference for everyone impacted by this disease. MOCA is here for women and families with meaningful support. We listen to our survivors' needs. In the past year, we've added new connection opportunities, including our MOCA walking groups. Now, women and their loved ones can find support while staying active. MOCA support groups are educational meetings, mentor program, MOCA cares kits, and more are all valuable tools to help survivors and loved ones navigate their journeys with this disease. One survivor told us, MOCA feels to me like a port in a storm. MOCA is a continuing and dependable source of empathy, ideas, and understanding. MOCA offers meaningful connection and hope. Through the years, MOCA has awarded a total of more than $500,000 in DREAM Awards, thanks to the funding specifically provided for this program by a couple of generous donors. We've made the dreams of 151 women come true with the MOCA of DREAM Awards. more for women and families. And we're providing more education than ever before. MOCA has now reached more than 6,600 healthcare students through our medical education programs. Last year alone, our survivor volunteers educated more than 350 medical and nursing students at colleges and universities across Minnesota. MOCA makes an impact in so many ways, through our health fairs, community events, and the media. We're raising awareness and reaching out to thousands of people every year. Together, we are changing the future of ovarian cancer. We are steadfast in our commitment to advancing vital ovarian cancer research. Tonight, we're thrilled to present our 2023 MOCA Research Awards to five Minnesota-based ovarian cancer research projects. You'll hear more about uh, MOCA's research milestones and our new innovative projects a little bit later in our program. First, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you in the audience tonight. We are fortunate to have the support of so many dedicated volunteers, researchers, healthcare providers, fundraisers, and donors. You are the reason MOCA is making more progress possible. I would also like to thank MOCA's board of directors. We are grateful for your leadership and your commitment to our mission. <laughs> it has been a true honor to serve on the MOCA board for the past six years, and for the past five years as MOCA's board chair. I've had the opportunity to work with so many incredible people who share my passion for this cause, and you guys know I'm very, very passionate about this. This experience has been very meaningful and enriching in so many ways. Now, I'd like to take a moment to thank my family. You are my rock. And I'm forever grateful for your support. My husband's here, my 
more family in the back. <laughs> governance and term limits that are required to maintain the highest standards, I will be stepping down as board chair this evening. Please be assured my commitment to MOCA will not waver. Although this is a bittersweet time for me, I am excited to announce the MOCA board secretary and survivor, Carol Peterson, will be our new MOCA board chair. <laughs> with fellow survivors. Carol joined the MOCA Board of Directors in May 2019. She took on the role of MOCA's Board Secretary in 2021 and served on our Executive Committee. Through the years, Carol has volunteered for MOCA in several ways. As a freelance photographer, she's taken photos for us at several MOCA events. Carol has also led an educational workshop and shares her time and talents with MOCA in so many ways. Thanks, Carol. As I hand off the position of board chair to Carol, I'm excited for MOCA's future. And I'm confident the board is in great hands. Congratulations, Carol. Let's give a round of, for Carol. And come on up, Carol. <laughs> so much. Oh my goodness. It's been an honor to serve with you on the MOCA board and we are so grateful for your leadership as chair over the past five years and your dedication to MOCA. We are fortunate you'll be continue to, continuing to chair our light um, Duluth Teal Gala. We need you for that. Um, volunteering with our Survivors Teaching Students Program and helping us raise awareness as a spokesperson. Thank you so much for your service as board chair and for all that you do for MOCA. And we set this gift as a small token. stepping down this evening. Um, Samia Miller, Miller has served on the MOCA board since 2021. Samia is unable to be with us this evening, but would like, we would like to thank her for her contributions to MOCA. Now it's time to welcome some of our incoming board members. First, I would like to introduce you to Melissa Cook. Melissa is an ovarian cancer survivor. She became involved with MOCA in 2016. Shortly after her diagnosis, diagnosis at age 39, since then, Melissa has become a MOCA mentor. She enjoys connecting with other survivors on a one-on-one -on -one basis and in our support groups. Melissa also serves on our Black, White, and Teal Gala Committee, and she led the effort um, for our new basket raffle, if there are any of you participated in that. It was very fun. Uh, Melissa and her friends also made the beautiful bracelets. I got one. Um, we shared with uh, survivors attending the gala, so they're beautiful. She has also volunteered at several other MOCA events, including Home Tale Strides, and Melissa led a Living Well workshop on vision boards uh, for MOCA survivors. You may have also no noticed Melissa tonight taking photos at our meeting. Um, and she's, so she's always willing to lend a hand, so we definitely appreciate that. She cur currently works as an account manager at Great Northern Company, and we are so looking forward to working with you on the board. Melissa. Okay, next 
first I would like you to int introduce you to Nancy Libby. Nancy is um, a, fam a familiar face to many of you, to m most of us, and we are so excited to welcome her back to the MOCA Board of Directors. Nancy previously served on the MOCA Board from 2015 um, to uh, 2022 and served two terms. She also held the role of Vice Chair and became a member of our Executive Committee and later our Finance Committee. Nancy first got involved with MOCA's Walk and Run event in 2002 after her mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Later, Nancy became a co-chair of this event, a role that she continues to this day. Nancy is heavily involved in the planning and coordination for Home Till Strides this September, and she's also a regular volunteer for MOCA. Um, Nancy, will you please join us up here? Welcome back, John Wetzel, to the MOCA board. John is also well known to many of you. Like Nancy, he has previously served on the board of directors for two terms. John has been a dedicated MOCA supporter for more than 20 years now. He first became involved with MOCA after his wife, Joy, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer back in 2001. Joy also served as a MOCA board member. After Joy's passing in 2014, John continued his involvement with MOCA, and he is a Home Till Strides area chair. And, and he helps coordinate registration for this event. John is also one of the founding members of our Men of MOCA group, and like Nancy, a regular volunteer. John, we thank you for all you do for MOCA, and we're honored to have, served, to have you serve on the MOCA board again with us. Please join us up here. to um, 
Mocus Operations and Membership Manager, Constance White. I, um, it's amazing that I've been here for 21 years. <laughs> Constance was the second staff person. She's been with Mocha for 17 years. And She's done communications. She currently serves as our operations and membership manager. She manages our building, our database, does all our IT. If anyone of you wants to take on an impossible job, we are hiring. <laughs> um, there's so much that Constance has done for the organization. I don't think we'll really know until she's gone, and then we'll have her on speed dial. So thanks, Constance. We will certainly miss you. And I'm going to keep thanking you between now. She'll be with us until September because she's very thoughtful that way. Um, uh, so we'll keep thanking you. I am super excited about tonight. This is, um, this is when we get to give the money away that we've all been working hard on raising all year. Tonight we're going to award $450,000 to Minnesota-based projects. Um, and with that, uh, we will be hitting $11 million. Um, and that's not all. We still have $150,000 to award this year, and that will go to our National Early Detection Research Award, which we will be giving out in November. Uh, that process is currently open. Uh, we are accepting applications from across the country. And I'm um, super excited to see what comes in there. We are dedicated to accelerating progress for an early detection test and new and better treatments to change the future of this disease. You are the reason we are building this momentum. And together, we are making a difference. In the past 20 years, we have seen a rapid increase in the number of new treatments available to women diagnosed with ovarian cancer. It's taken 20 years. <laughs> I'm glad I stuck around for this long. About five years ago, PARP inhibitors really hit the uh, bedside. I mean, they were in um, trials for a while. PARP inhibitors have been the biggest development in the treatment of this disease. I know that there are survivors here tonight who are benefiting from them. And new research, some of which MOCA is funding, is exploring when PARPs are most effective, who they work the best for, and how to overcome PARP resistance, which we are learning more about. In the past year, antibody drug conjugates, ADCs, are giving more hope to women. Late last year, one of these ADCs, known as Elahair, became available to women whose tumors are folate receptor alpha high. And I know there's someone in this room who's considering going on that drug. I hope it works as well as it has in clinical trials. I am really excited. These are the new treatments that we've been waiting for. And there are more targeted treatments on the horizon. Tumor testing is becoming increasingly important, and precision medicine is offering more options to women who are diagnosed today. Through the years, we have seen many discoveries that have led to more effective treatments, treatments that allow women to live longer, better quality lives. The $11 million that MOCA has provided to ovarian cancer research over the years has helped make this progress possible. Our funding has enabled Minnesota researchers to receive multi-million dollar federal grants to expand their work. MOCA-funded research has led to clinical trials, the development of vaccines for the prevention of recurrent disease, and advancements on an early detection test. MOCA also collaborates with partner organizations to accelerate the pace of research. We are proud to partner with Any Mountain a nonprofit organization making national headlines with the Mount Everest track team. The team includes ovarian cancer survivors, gynecologic oncologists, and supporters who reached Mount Everest Base Camp in April. 
Two ovarian cancer survivors continued their journey to summer, summit Everest this month, and we are so thrilled to share that Jess Waddell did summit Everest on Sunday, the first ovarian cancer survivor to ever do so. Any Mountain's goal is to raise awareness and support for the prevention and early detection of ovarian cancer. MOCA is partnering with Any Mountain, and we are directing the funding that is raised through this journey, it's over $500,000 now, to support a national clinical trial focused on a novel approach to surgical prevention of ovarian cancer called the tuba wisp tube trial. The trial is designed to give women additional options to reduce their risk while maintaining other important health functions. It is the type of research that will change the future of ovarian cancer, helping women to live longer, better lives. Soon we'll be awarding our, our research awards tonight. I just want to tell you a little bit about our process. We work hard to ensure that every dollar awarded through these grants goes directly to advance ovarian cancer research. These, these are not gifts to research institutions. They are awards for specific work to be done. Each year, MOVA conducts a rigorous competitive grant making process. Researchers submit applications to MOCA, and they are, they are reviewed by a team of national scientific reviewers from across the country. This team is made up of scientists, some MDs, some PhDs, all highly regarded in their fields. They review to make sure that the projects are well designed and are of national significance. The projects must also answer important questions. Our consumer research reviewers also play an important role in selecting our projects. These reviewers represent women and families impacted by ovarian cancer and help us choose projects that are most likely to benefit those that we serve. We're grateful to these teams of national scientific and consumer research reviewers. They do this as service to the field. We don't, they're not paid in any way. It's always a challenge to get them to keep doing it. Not our, cons not our dedicated consumer reviewers, but the National Scientific Reviewers. Um, are, it's really a testament to MOCA. We are highly regarded across the country, and they, they are happy to do it. They appreciate the money that we raise to help advance the research, and uh, we, we're happy to continue to review for us. Um, now I would like to to introduce to you one of our consumer reviewers, Becky Drexler. She's an ovarian cancer survivor, a MOCA board member, the chair of our Black, White, and Teal Gala Committee, and one of our research reviewers. She, she will announce our first two awards. Becky? Thank you so much. I'm not as fancy as back in here. There we go. All right, still working? Yes. Okay. All right, got too many things here. Sorry. Um, good evening. Um, as an almost five year ovarian cancer survivor and someone who worked in clinical trial research for many years, Reviewing research grants for MOCA really is an inspiring and exciting time for me. Um, when I was asked to introduce a couple of our uh, recipients tonight, I wanted to find out more about their work, um, and so I did a little bit of my own research. My husband, though, calls it um, internet stalking. <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> Our first um, recipient is Dr. Rachel Vogel from the University of Minnesota. She's an associate professor in the Department of OBGYN, Division of Gynecologic Oncology. Dr. Vogel's research focuses on short and long term physical, emotional, and social effects of cancer and on developing interventions to mitigate those effects. 
Dr. Vogel's project was awarded $50,000 to examine the associations between cytomegalovirus, CMV, which is a common virus, and chemo brain, which I know many of those in the audience, including myself, know very well. Um, Dr. Vogel, please join us and tell us a little bit more about your project. and she'd stop mid-sentence and forget what she was talking about. Um, and she was very frustrated by this. She was a very independent woman. Um, I like to say she's incredibly smart. And my mom gets really mad, but I definitely got my smarts from my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, this, this woman could do, she did the uh, crossword every day. She knew all the answers on Jeopardy. Yeah, I just remember, that's this, like, this vivid memory in my head. And so she was incredibly frustrated by these symptoms. And, and frankly, she was lucky because her symptoms resolved after she stopped treatment. Um, but that's not true for everyone. Um, and so ever since she passed in 2017, I've been really trying to figure out how can we work to improve research in chemo brain. Um, and so that is what I'm finally, hopefully, able to do. Uh, and so this, this list of symptoms here, again, it sounds like many of you in this room probably are familiar with these. Um, but all of these symptoms can be transients, come and go, and it's been estimated in research that about 25% of women going through ovarian cancer treatment experience chemo brain, and frankly, I think that's an underestimate. Because, and, the, and the biggest reason is because it's really hard to measure, right? It's not, you know, it's, it's just a difference. You feel different. You can't think quite the same way. Um, and, and because it's hard to measure, it's been really hard to research. Um, and so I will say there's actually been one benefit of the COVID pandemic, and that is that we figured out that COVID long haul uh, brain fog actually symptom-wise is very similar to chemo brain. And so because we were throwing all of that money into COVID, we were able to start learning a lot more about chemo brain. And so what they discovered in COVID is that it's the virus causes inflammation, which then causes neuroinflammation, okay? And so because of that, then we started thinking, well, what if the viruses are part of the chemo brain issue? And so that is the question that I will be answering with this research. Uh, and so really, the, the question is, I'm starting simply, so we're focusing on CMV, but really it can be any virus. Um, so as Becky said, CMV is a really common cold virus that most of us have been exposed to. Um, and I describe it like chicken pox. So once you've had it, it can hang out in your body and it can reactivate. And so, so we're using CMV as this proxy, if you will, of you know, when your body is going through chemotherapy, going through cancer, your immune system is suppressed, and so something like CMV can reactivate. And so we wanted to see if you had active CMV at the time of your diagnosis, were you more prone to chemo brain? And I actually have preliminary data that suggests that that is the case. Um, and so that's, that work is, is continuing, but what the goal of this grant is to understand, well, is that actually driven by inflammation, um, which is what we would expect based on the COVID data. And so that's what we'll be focusing on. This grant will be focusing on trying to understand is inflammation that we can measure at baseline, does that predict who's gonna end up with these chemo brain symptoms? And then ultimately, we want to show that it, that inflammation is driven by viruses that we're exposed to. And so that is really the goal of this project. And so I have to show this. Um, so I, my daughter here on the left, um, our very first uh, teal, let me get this right, home teal strides <laughs> walk run uh, was in 2015 in honor of my grandma. 
And then, then this, uh, but on the right is my son and daughter, very much enjoying the fun run this past fall. <laughs> uh, and so we, I'm so thankful for all of the work that MOGA does. Um, and I hope to do as much as I can to improve the lives of ovarian cancer survivors. So thank you. physiological barriers, stem cell derived models of healthy and diseased tissues and biomanufacturing technologies for emerging cell based immune therapies. They are a busy group. <laughs> Dr. Azarin was awarded $100,000 for her proposal titled Development of Nanomaterials for Ultrasound Mediated Destruction of Metastatic Ovarian Cancer Tumors. Now that sounds pretty interesting to me, but I'm going to let her explain what it really means because I don't get it. <laughs> so, hello everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. So, I figured I'd start out with just how, how did I end up here, especially as an engineer. Uh, so, uh, I'm a chemical engineer by training, but my research has always been in the biological side of, of chemical engineering and really in um, developing new therapeutic approaches. So, understanding diseases and, and, and developing therapies. And so, I arrived at Minnesota in 2014, and um, I had done my postdoctoral training in breast cancer research. And early on, my first year here, I had the great fortune of just kind of being brought along uh, by a collaborator to a meeting he was having with Dr. Melissa Geller, who was on one of the um, slides earlier. And that meeting just completely transformed um, my lab's cancer research arm uh, because we pretty much, you know, in the course of that meeting, I learned, it was the first time I really learned about um, the, the clinical progression of ovarian cancer and really the urgent need for, for alternative therapies. And in, in hearing about it, I really thought that a lot of the tools that my group was interested in developing uh, could potentially impact the lives of ovarian cancer patients. And so I kind of left that meeting and just uh, started the process of slowly switching all of our breast cancer work into ovarian cancer. And now um, it's a big, a big arm of, of what we do. Um, and so uh, we're, and, and in particular, I would say, you know, as an engineer, sometimes our approaches are a little bit outside the box. And so it can be hard um, to, to get traction at times. And I'm, so I'm very grateful uh, to MOGA for the funding uh, in order to help us get some really key preclinical data um, for what I hope will be uh, a new therapy for ovarian cancer. So just to kind of give you some uh, sense of where we're, we're coming from, there's a lot of different immune cell-based therapies in development and clinical trials um, for ovarian cancer. Uh, a lot of these therapies involve taking immune cells out of a patient's growing them, manipulating them outside the body, and putting them back in. So this is just kind of one example here that shows all of the, the patient's hard to see here, but uh, all the various steps that go into um, the development of this therapy. And so the challenge for these therapies, uh, for some of them, is that they um, can be very time intensive, so they can take months to develop for a patient, and they can be very expensive, sometimes costing on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the therapy. So what my group is interested in is using biomaterials, so something that you would implant or inject in the body, in order to do a lot of this work all within the body. So basically, you don't have to take anything out and put it back in. Um, and so we, we hope that this could be sort of a widely accessible um, type of therapy. And so what we do, what we're interested in in this particular project, is so you have um, ovarian cancer and initial diagnosis that could be potentially spread all throughout the abdominal cavity, or maybe this is a recurrence of chemo-resistant disease. And so you would inject a nanomaterial, so very, very small materials, that inside of them contain a small molecule called a sonosensitizer. 
And so what this molecule does is that the material carries it to the cancer cells. Once it's in the cancer cells, if I just apply ultrasound through the skin, um, I will kill any cells that have accumulated this molecule. Um, and so the idea is you would inject these into the abdominal cavity, you'd wait about 24 hours for them to find the cancer cells, and then you just come in with the ultrasound non-invasively and, and kill the cancer cells. Now, you've now killed a massive number of cancer cells all of a sudden, this triggers an immune response. And so the other piece of this is we're interested in how this cell killing process then stimulates the immune system in order to generate these uh, this sort of army of immune cells that now recognizes your tumor cells and is, is prepared to um, kill any remaining tumor cells in the body or potentially protect against recurrence of the disease. And so uh, you can think of this as sort of a vaccination type strategy all within the body, so not removing anything um, and manipulating it outside the body. And so what we've done up till now has all just been proof of principle in, um, in a dish. And so we've taken um, uh, ovarian cancer patient tumors from ascites fluid, and we've shown that we can bind them to our materials and kill them with ultrasound. So if you want some proof, uh, this is, oh, you can't see the proof because you can't see the red over here, but basically take my word for it that in a dish, this works great. Um, but we all know that a dish and a human, there's a big disconnect there. And so um, the major um, uh, benefit of the, the, the MOCO funding will enable us to do is that we will be able to advance the clinical path of this technology. So the, the main things that we're focused on, one is biocompatibility. So the materials that we use here are not necessarily the most FDA-friendly materials. And so we're going to be transitioning to a material that has an easier path to the clinic. Um, and then also improving the um, specificity for cancer cells. So making sure that the material is finding the cancer cells and not the healthy cells. Um, in the abdomen. And so that's uh, going to enable us to get some key preclinical data that we think will hopefully help us translate this. And so thank you to MOCA, to all of you, and to the people. I should acknowledge that long list of things that we do. I don't do any of them. Um, I just mentor the students who do them. And so here are the students. Um, and then my uh, co-investigator on this, uh, Natalie Becky, and then there, there was some funding that led to the preliminary data, but really um, MOCA is what's enabling us to keep going with this technology and get this free so thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm Christine and I'm back. <laughs> I'm uh, honored to be one of the consumer reviewers. Uh, our next is Dr. Gunda Georg, and she's a researcher at the University of Minnesota. She will be awarded $100,000 for her research project. Dr. Georg has a broad background in drug discovery and development. Her project titled Discovery and Development of Allosteric Inhibitors of CDK2 Cyclin E as Non-Toxic Ovarian Drugs is a continuation of a project we funded last year, which I find exciting. This means that we're making progress. While her project is still developing, it will have a high payout if successful. Based on Dr. Gaylord's promising preliminary data, she hopes to discover and develop a novel non-toxic ovarian cancer drug. As you know, chemotherapy drugs can be quite toxic and have many side effects. To hear of research being carried out for a non-toxic non ovarian cancer drug is not only quite exciting, it's necessary. Dr. Georg will be targeting high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which is the most common uh, subset of ovarian cancer. To hear more about this promising research, I would like to introduce Dr. Gunda Georg.
would be really nice and educational for them to come here uh, and see uh, all of you here about MOCA um, and uh, I guess get maybe inspiration to work even harder in your life. <laughs>
And um, so um, what we'd like to do is to actually combine now two keys, the keys to the trap door and the other key, and make an even better, I guess, key, you know, really engineered in a, in a, in a new way. And uh, the next um, uh, approach is um, <coughs> we are blocking uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this protein by uh, actually uh, preventing its function and um, so um, um, <coughs> rendering it inactive in, in the second approach and also in the third approach, the final approach, we're going to just totally destroy the protein that is the offending protein. Okay? So there's a lot of things that we are trying to do and I really hope that one of those, if not all three of those, will, I guess, give us some success. And um, you know, what I really hope is that we will <clears throat> soon be able to um, use one of these compounds um, and do a, um, um, a study in an animal model for the ovarian cancer. And that would set the stage for further development if that works out. And then, of course, um, you know, you, it's still a, a long way to, to a work that the FDA is approving. But I think we, once we have maybe shown these approaches here and maybe then even um, we have an opportunity to license what we discover, um, patent it, license it, and then have a pharmaceutical company can, I guess, help us to bring it forward. And I have done this actually a couple of times before uh, with an anti cancer drug and with a male contraceptive. So it is possible, even so it's difficult to do in an academic setting because we always lack the resources. And so that's why I'm so grateful that with the support from MOCA, we can continue, which I think is a really good project for the future. Thank you. Research Award winner is Dr. Martina Pissarro from the University of Minnesota. Her project is titled Precision Medicine for ARID1A Mutated Ovarian Cancer. She will be awarded $100,000 for one year. Dr. Pissarro believes her project could have immediate translational relevance and dramatically change the clinical management of ovarian cancer. Dr. Pizarro's research is focused on clear cell ovarian cancer. Up to 70% of the patients diagnosed with this type of cancer have inactivating mutations of this particular gene. She will be addressing the unique uh, challenges of the ARID1A gene. She will be addressed, I'm sorry, <laughs> Um, Dr. Pizarro has a long-standing interest in targeted therapies for chemo-resistant ovarian cancer. In summary, this grant is, is designed to address um, the unique challenges of clear cell carcinoma by providing personalized and long-lasting therapeutic approaches for this challenging disease. One particular supporter of this research believes that the successful completion of this project can be quickly implemented into the clinics. That would be so beneficial to women diagnosed with clear cell ovarian cancer. And on that note, I'd like to introduce Dr. Martina, Martina Rosaro to tell us more about her research. Um, uh, but thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you um, uh, to all of you for coming, and thank you to the Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance community at large, including the reviewers that Kathleen was mentioning. That every year they are given the task of you know, making very tough decisions as far as what are the most meritorious grants for that year to be funded. Um, uh, so, so in, uh, uh, in my laboratory, we have been uh, fortunate enough to have received um, um, MOCA fundings in the past. 
Uh, we did that in 2018, in 2016, and in 2013, uh, and we received uh, over a quarter of a million dollars. And, um, and because of the money that you provided to our laboratories and because of the people that have done the work, we have actually made some uh, reasonable dents in understanding how cancer, ovarian cancer initiates, progresses, and how um, chemo-resistant develops. Uh, some, this, this is really an international group of people that with whom we are collaborating on ovarian cancer research, and some faces may be familiar to you, some are physicians at the University of Minnesota, uh, some are um, uh, ovarian cancer investigators that have received uh, MOCA money for their research, uh, and some are laboratory members, some of whom you can actually see at the, um, to, the, to the left. Uh, so it is uh, thank you to their very hard work that we were able to make some uh, you know, discoveries and now we know better uh, what are the biomarkers, for example, for ovarian cancer chemo resistance. We know better uh, about what are some of the mechanisms that are leading to ovarian cancer chemo resistance. Chemo resistance. And what I want to talk about today is one of our uh, findings that has led to the um, uh, research uh, project that I'm going to discuss today that has to do with targeting mitochondrial metabolism in clear cell carcinoma of the ovaries. So in this particular piece of work, we have discovered that um, clear cell carcinoma that carry a one mutation, and I don't know if I'm going to mess it up. The thing is that either I see you or I see what I write. <laughs> age that counts, but is there a point? But anyway, so, so um, about 70% of clear, uh, clear cell carcinoma of the ovaries present a uh, mutation in RE1A, and when uh, we have this mutation, you see to the right, we have loss of protein. So what we have discovered is that um, clear cell carcinoma that has mutation in RE1A gene are particularly sensitive to a new class of uh, molecules that are called mitochondrial inhibitors. So what we are going to do with the money that you gave us this year, we are going to perform efficacy studies where we are going to look at the combination between metformin and lefunomide and genitri plus lefunomide. Those are both FDA-approved mitochondrial inhibitors. Uh, and what we want to do, we want to test whether the combination of this drug can be a personalized and precision medicine for everyone in the tumors. So thank you again for being here. Thank you again for supporting um, our research. I promise you we will spend the money well. And I want you to know that the seed money that you have provided us in the past were instrumental for our laboratories and our collaborators to get additional money, including national uh, and local um, uh, funding agencies, as well as federal uh, funding agencies, including uh, the Department of Defense and the, um, and the NIH. Thank you again. Hi, my name is Bob McDonald, and I'm not a reviewer. I've always wanted to be smart enough to be a reviewer, but I guess it's not happening. I'm a fundraiser, so <laughs> we raise money. Uh, this is my favorite night of the year. Uh, you know, the research is incredible. It's our hope for the future. And, you know, Christmas is okay, Thanksgiving is kind of okay, but I can tell you my wife, Pam, and I, she's an eight-time survivor of ovarian cancer and coming up on her 20th anniversary this year. This is a very happy year. And that's not the way everybody is in the back there. So for uh, two decades, we've been uh, with Boca, and they've been with us. Uh, I guess maybe 10, 12 years ago, we went to a fundraiser in Manhattan, which was a spin cycling fundraiser. And on the way home, Pam said, we can do this. So uh, we had run 10 spin it deals and raised money for ovarian cancer and given it all to Mocha. We 
love this process. Uh, we love the, the technical process, the review process, and how well we spend our money. We're so lucky and grateful that we have such fantastic researchers in Minnesota. I mean, We focus our efforts on those projects that minimize the chance of a recurrence. And early detection is obviously important for a whole range of people, but in our case, our interest is prevention of recurrence, a nasty problem, and you guys know that. Um, we couldn't be more grateful to those people that have supported Spin It Teal over the years. Uh, you get to pay for your pain, you come in and, <laughs> and sweat and work and hurt, and you get to pay money. So, what could be better? Uh, we have an especially uh, fun time introducing this year's recipient because she's been here many times before. So, I'm thrilled to announce that Amy Skubitz has won the Spin It Teal Award for this year. And she's a professor, and I have to read this because it's a long enough title, professor at the Department of Laboratory Medicine and director of the Ovarian Cancer Early Detection Program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, she's got an incredible project this year, and I'm going to let her explain it to you. So thank you, Amy. <laughs> participated in the studies and provided biospecimens for my research, uh, not this project, but all the other ones, um, and also all of you volunteers and people who have contributed to MOFA since really your support makes my research possible. Um, well, so, you know, I've been here 20 years, and so I think you probably have seen me before, and I've been doing a lot of volunteering and appearing on various TV things and things like that, so I consider myself the token research scientist <laughs> spokesperson for MOCA, so if you ever need me, I'm still around, and I'll do it some more. Um, this is a project that's really come full circle for me uh, over the past 20 years, because my first grant from MOCA was actually um, in 2003, and it was trying to improve the treatment of ovarian <laughs> cancer, understanding the role of spheroids in the spread of ovarian cancer. Not steroids, but spheroids. And for those of you who don't know what spheroids are, in ovarian cancer, um, uh, the cancer cells can be spread, uh, spread off of the surface of the ovary. And then whenever we look at what does a cytes fluid actually look like from the peritoneal cavity of women um, in our laboratory, we see these single cells, but we also see these multicellular aggregates, which we call spheroids, because they're kind of spherical in shape. And why are they the bad guys? Well, basically, they're bad because they're very frequently chemo-resistant. And the reason is because, as you can see, there are a group of cells that are all clustered together, so they're protected from chemotherapy. The other thing is a lot of chemotherapy is actually geared toward rapidly proliferating cells, and these spheroids don't really move, grow that quickly, so they're resistant to chemo. The other thing is that um, they're able, as this whole group, to adhere to other organs, so they're sticky and they can adhere to the other organs, they're able to invade, and they're able to spread to other organs, and that's um, kind of the deadly part of ovarian cancer. So what we decided to do uh, nearly 20 years ago was try to say how can we stop ovarian cancer from spreading to these other organs? And our answer was to block cell adhesion. And this can be done two ways. One is to stop those spheroids from even forming in the first place, because if we can do that, then we could maybe get the cells to be uh, sensitive to chemotherapy. And the other thing is why you want to stop the cancer cells from adhering to these mesothelial cells that line the peritoneal cavity. And so our answer to this 10 years ago was to focus on one protein, it's called Mectin-4, and it's this squiggly thing that's on the surface of ovarian cancer cells. 
And the idea is that we've shown that this, ovary, this one protein, connected 4 is overexpressed in most types of ovarian cancer, and it's on the surface of the cell. So importantly, as you see here, it can be involved in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, and that would lead to the formation of those spheroids. Um, so what we decided to do was to make little parts of Nectin-4 and just try to find out which parts were actually the functionally active parts of this molecule. Um, in doing so, we found that several <coughs> peptides could actually block cell adhesion, and more importantly for this project is can they block the spheroids from forming. And we actually did find one that was really good, and this is what we call peptide 10, uh, not a fancy name, but um, we patented all of these peptides, and the focus of the project is on peptide 10. Um, and this video here is a basically a um, two-day video, but what, I've sped it up a bit. And we, in the, on the left, sorry, on the right-hand side, we put 5,000 ovarian cancer cells in a well, and we said, go ahead for an extended period of time, and you see it forms this tight spheroid, whereas this on the left side has peptide 10 added, and even over a two-day period of time, it's very difficult for the cells to get together and form spheroids. And so in this project, we have some preliminary data in which we've taken ovarian cancer cells and we've added either no peptide or peptide 10. And we added that to a well and then waited 18 hours and then added a low dose of cisplatin and then waited another 42 hours and said, okay, at the end of 60 hours, let's look and see how many cells are dead or alive. And when the, pep the wells that had just no peptide added to the cells, the cells would form those tight spheroids like that video that I showed. And um, when we added the chemotherapy, yeah, there was some cell death, but not a lot. In contrast, those wells that had the peptide 10 added, and then we added this, the um, cisplatin 18 hours later, those cells had remained as single cells. So the chemotherapy was very effective. And so we concluded that this peptide 10 is able to inhibit uh, the ability of cells to kill, uh, it's, it increases the ability of uh, cisplatin to kill the ovarian cancer cells. So in this project, it really have two aims. One of them is to use more uh, ovarian cancer cell lines and to actually see if we can replicate this so it's not just one cell line that has this effect. And then also to go ahead and take patients on uh, cells, take those ovarian cancer cells and let them form steroids either with or without peptide 10, adding the chemotherapy and seeing if we can block this. Because really our long-term goal is to kind of translate this peptide 10 uh, just like Dr. Duarte talked about her, her um, treatment, is something that you could translate it into the clinic. So women who have ovarian cancer, when they're just getting uh, chemotherapy, could you have peptide 10 in there as well and have that in the peritoneal cavity? And so you're blocking cell adhesion um, to, to form the serum, and you're also blocking the cells adhering to the other organs. Um, and our hope is that this could basically stop the occurrence of ovarian cancer. So, thank you. What a, what a great group of research projects we're funding this year, and um, I really appreciate our researchers' commitment to this disease. As you know, I talked earlier about our board, but um, I don't know how many of you understand how difficult it is to get research grants and that these brilliant scientists who could be spending all of their time in the lab figuring these things out have to spend a lot of time going after grants. Small grants, big grants, national grants. It's a super competitive atmosphere. I like to think that MOCA is helping to make their jobs a little easier they, I hope you researchers feel our support. We all want you to win. <laughs> we, want your, we want these to be successful and we want you to get more support. Um, I uh, especially want to thank Amy. She is our sp go-to spokesperson. She's so good at describing um, complicated things and um, she has been committed to uh, new treatments, the pursuit of the Holy Grail, the early detection test for 20 years. Um, and we're grateful for your contributions to the field. 
I also really want to thank Bob and Pam McDonald. They have been a really fun team to work with over 20 years. Super inspiring in so many ways. Uh, before they started Spin It Deal, they used to be among the top fundraisers of Home Deal Strides, too. I, um, but once they got on the bikes, it was all about the bikes. And I got on the bike in lots of different cities around town. Um, it's been really fun. They've done it for 10 years. And this last year was their last year, they said. <laughs> and we're going to honor that and, uh, and celebrate 10 years of Spin It Teal. They have raised almost a million dollars for them. <laughs> contribution to MOCA this year to be a match for Get to the Max Day. So we hope that we will um, continue to raise a good amount of money to fund a research grant for the prevention of recurrence. Thanks so much, Bob and Pam. Stand up again, please, Pam. <laughs> and build momentum for a cure. I would like to share a meaningful way that you can help MOCA fund vital ovarian cancer research. Tonight, I would like you, um, I would like to ask you to consider joining our Forever Teal Circle Legacy Giving Program. When you designate a legacy gift and include MOCA in your estate planning, you can honor a family member or a friend and make a lasting contribution. Just this year, MOCA received several very special legacy gifts from those who were involved with MOCA and our community. I would like to mention two of them tonight, um, two special gifts that we have received from Jean Ann Rue and Joelle and Fatty George. Jean just passed away in March of this year. She got connected with MOCA in 2018, shortly after her ovarian cancer diagnosis. Jean and her partner, Alan, regularly attended the MOCA Connection Support Group at the MOCA office. Jean was an avid skier, pickleball player, and nature lover, and she generously designated a portion of her IRA to MOCA. Joe also got connected with MOCA shortly after her ovarian cancer diagnosis in 2017. She was very involved with MOCA. She attended most of our support groups, all of our programs, volunteered at awareness events, and took part in home deal strides. Joe received a 2017 Dream Award, and she brought enthusiasm, kindness, and joy to whatever she did. She passed away at the end of last year and gifted MOCA a part of her estate along with several other nonprofits that were important to her. Jean and Joe touched many lives and are grateful for their generous legacy gifts. There is more information in your program about our Forever Teal Circle, and there are brochures on each table. I would like to thank those of you who have already joined this program. If you're interested in making a legacy gift or have any questions, please reach out to me tonight or anytime at the MOCA office. Now I would like to invite our new board chair back to the podium to share a little bit about a couple of other upcoming projects and ways to get involved with MOCA. Yeah, I can. <laughs> Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I'm also inspired by the research and really excited about it. Um, not only for myself, uh, for my daughters and all the other survivors. Um, and I'm also honored to be representing this amazing organization, MOCA. Um, I'd like to invite you to learn more about MOCA's work in our new digital, an digital annual report, and it's now available on our, web our website. It actually just launched today. 
Um, so thank you to our friends at Intercross for donating their services and making this project possible. We also want to make sure to let you know about MOCA's walk and run event. Um, and there's more information on the back of your um, brochure tonight. Um, so I'd like to invite all of you to join us at the Home Till Strides for Ovarian Cancer. I don't think I've missed one yet. They're, they're so much fun. Um, and it's Saturday, September 9th. It's always the, it's always the, around the 9th um, at Rosalind Park in Edina. We, we walk. Uh, some people run. I don't run. Um, we gather with our family and friends, and we also have a lot of fun connecting with our community. The money raised at Home Chill Strides has a big impact on the amount of research and mo um, programs that MOCA provides. So be sure to sign up this year. We also have several volunteer opportunities and sponsorships available, so if you'd like to contribute, please let us know. Uh, Light to Luke Teal. We're also making plans now for MOCA's Light to Luke Teal Gala. And that's Saturday, September 23rd. Everything happens in September in Minnesota. <laughs> but that's in Duluth, and we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of this awesome event. The Light Duluth Teal Gala um, includes a cocktail reception, live and silent auctions, dinner, a program, games, music, and more. And it's all to benefit MOCA. Please consider join us, uh, joining us um, in the Northland this fall. Duluth area landmarks will light up in, um, in Teal to celebrate the gala and raise awareness for ovarian cancer on September 22nd and 23rd. So the registration details are also on the website. Um, one final reminder tonight, um, please take a moment to fill out the evaluations on your tables and drop them off on the way out. Um, we definitely want to hear about thoughts about this event. Again, be nice to the new <laughs> board chair. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, thank you for attending MOCA's annual meeting, and we're grateful for your support, and we hope to see you again soon.